Hello everybody out there. My name is Jason Norton. I'm the pastor here at Kings Trail Cowboy Church and I'm actually excited to do this little intro to the sermon um, because it's always a, a good thing to get your mind right and to get settled before you hear God's Word. And speaking of God's Word, I have a scripture for you. It's in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. It says, Come to me all you who labor and are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. So when Jesus said, will you come to me and find rest, he also said for you and I to learn from him. So in this sermon section, I pray that you learn the words of Jesus. I pray that you learn the word of God. And um, as you're listening, just remember that this is God's word, and his promise to you is, Faith come by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. So enjoy the message. Um, I pray it blesses you, and not just you, but everything in your life. And uh, we'll see you at the end. Love you. Bye-bye. And Lord, the, the last time I read that, um, I thank you. You'll give us new prayers when uh, we read your Word. So, Lord, I'm asking in Jesus' name that you would calibrate our ears to hear truth. Uh, Lord, uh, remove the ability to resist your presence. Remove our ability to say no to you. Remove our fleshy things that hinders us. Remove the enemy in Jesus' name. And, Lord, and as he gets off the property, we would show appreciated it would make us smile if you stomp on him a few times. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you did wash us in mercy, my goodness. Lord, may your name be magnified in this place. May you be glorified. Lord, may we not come to church to have church, but may we come to church to learn how to be the church. We love you, Lord. We ask it in your strong name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated, please. Lord Jesus. Scoggins Funeral Home. They're always very nice and uh, helpful. They let me borrow this casket for a sermon prop. And uh, I believe they said it was made by the Amish, Eric, is that what you said? It's a beautiful handmade casket. Um, if the Lord tarries and uh, I go not through the rapture, but I die like everyone else, I would want a nice little wooden one like this. Amen. Amen. Um, uh, today's message is, a, is a, maybe a hard message. I don't know. It depends on where you're at in your life. I'm not sure. I know our intent. Uh, here is to preach God's word, to magnify his name, to glorify him. And when that happens, you'll start seeing the Holy Spirit minister to people without even coming up front. Uh, he'll heal you through a song. He'll, he'll do these things. Um, but I do have uh, three stories before we jump off in the scripture. I pray that they're long enough to get the point across, but not too long to where I get preachy, because even a preacher can get preachy and needs to go on to the next thing. Um, but when I was in, after I graduated high school, I was 18 years old. Um, I got a job night stocking groceries at Brookshire's in McKinney. And no joke, it was probably one of the most difficult physically demanding jobs I've ever had in my life. Night stocking groceries is no joke. And um, I remember it being very, very hard. And when at the end of the night, or end of the, yeah, end of the night when the sun's coming up, and you have to face the store and put all the Campbell's soup up. I remember one morning I was so tired that I fell asleep standing up and knocked down all the Campbell's soups in the aisle. And I had a really sweet boss at saw compassion and said, big old idiot, pick it back up. It's <laughs> like, golly, ain't no love in this place. <laughs> and uh, anyway, one night I was not stocking groceries and we we're about to close this New Year's Eve. 
and it was about to close and this guy come in and he's paying for something I forgot what he's getting but he had it pulled out of his pocket like four or five inches of cash and he's like what are you doing up here working on New Year's Eve you know like how old are you and so I'm 18 he said man you want a job that bad come work for me I made about two grand in the last hour well kind of figured what he was doing and uh, I was like no I can't do that man I'm I just can't do that. And uh, he's like, well, if you change your mind, I'll be out in the parking lot for a little bit longer and you can come out here and make some money and you won't have to be getting minimum wage stocking groceries. I said, all right, well, thank you. And uh, so he left, we locked the store up and um, we we're stocking groceries. And man, they, they turn on music over the intercom in the middle of the night and um, it was really, I mean, it's very fast paced from start to finish. I mean, they, they give you a certain amount of aisles to, to stock, and if you don't stock it, you'll write you up. You don't stock it the next time, they'll write you up. You don't stock it the next time, you're fired. So there's a lot of pressure into doing it. And um, I remember the music was playing. I'm trying to keep up with not stocking these groceries, and I'm on my knees putting, I think it was on the pickle aisle. You got to be slow down with them because you can break them. And they stink. They make the whole aisle stink. So um, I remember the boss getting over the intercom. He goes, everybody stop. I'm like, wow. He was not shy either. And uh, stood up and he said, happy new year. Now get back to work. <laughs> and I remember when he said that, I, I literally, you all know, keep in mind, I was 18 years old. I was a young man. So I got back down on my knees and I was stalking some groceries and I literally thought this. I said, I'm such a loser. I could, I could be, y'all keep in mind, because I remember the feeling I had. Y'all keep in mind, I'm 18 and, and everybody my age is playing. Everybody my age is out partying. And here I'm stalking pickles on New Year's Eve and a part of me died that night. You know, and I look back now and I'm so thankful that he had me stocking groceries and not partying. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, when I was a child, I spoke as a child, understood as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. There comes a time that you have to put away childish behavior. And that translates in the spirit as well. There comes a time, you child of God, you need to be done with some stuff. You have to be done with some stuff, and, and part of me died that night, and I'm so thankful it did. How many know that there's some things that should die in you that will turn beautiful? Matter of fact, there's some things that are not going to manifest until that part of you does die. Next story, I'm uh, graduating airborne school, about two, three hundred graduates, and everybody's families are there. Um, young young men about to get married to their wives and they're all excited because they're engaged and they got these silver wings on their chest and they got this brand new beret military beret that you put on the first time you don your beret it's just a really cool feeling and then um, you see people with friends and family and they're loving each other high-fiving each other hugging each other and they're about to leave and go eat real food because you don't get fed real food in the military and um, I remember I got on a truck, um, about me and about 14, 15 other guys to go down um, to try out to be an Army Ranger. And so as I was getting on this truck, I'm getting screamed at, hollered at, cussed at, and they don't care who's listening. They don't. And um, if you don't get on the truck fast enough, the truck will take off and you'll run to where we're going. That's about how they welcome you. And you get there, and we got that was our introduction to about four hours of PT. Um, it is just terrible. They and they're not shy about it. Though, so anyway, it, it just gets really bad. And I was sitting there again, going, I could have went off and been with family and friends and had a steak or something. And here, part of me died that moment because the Lord, I didn't know it then, but I know it now. The Lord was showing me that if you want to do more, you got to be more. And in some aspects in the, in the kingdom of God, if you want to do more, you got to die more. 
And as you see that things get specialized, you'll see that you're more and more by yourself. Pastor Dwayne talked about that. He says sometimes you feel like you're all alone, and sometimes you're going to be alone. And sometimes, guess what? In Jesus' name, you need to be alone. Part of me died that night or that day. And then my last story is we jumped into Nevada to do a training mission. We flew from Georgia to Nevada, which is a long flight. But once you get there, you have a low-level flight. And uh, this is getting kind of graphic, but y'all need to understand what environment it was. Um, when you jump into Nevada, the air in Nevada is thinner because it's a mountainous environment. And if air is thinner, that means the parachute don't fill up as good and then you fall faster. So there's no gentle fall or PLF, performance landing fall, what they teach in airborne school. You literally just fall and you hit the ground like a sack of rocks. Um, but during the flight, a uh, low-level flight is speed up, slow down, go high, go low. I mean, you ever had turbulence real bad on an airplane? You imagine that times 20 for hours. So eventually, um, however many Rangers we had on the board, on board that aircraft, um, I, if we had 80, 70 of them had already puked. And you can imagine how that would smell. And it's just a chain reaction. It was terrible, terrible environment. And I don't think anybody jumped out the airplane that day. I think everybody, once that door opened, they just fell out. Because they were just like, get me off this plane. And you don't sit in nice little comfortable seats. You sit on the ground. And I'm leaning. The guy behind me has his legs spread. I get up as close as I can to him. My parachute sits on him. And my rucksack in between. And same all the way down. And you're, you're literally like crammed sard sardines. So when you get sick, you can't get sick off to the side. It's on, all over yourself and on each other. Sorry, but that's what it was. Um, so we jump out and they have these, these procedures that you have to follow. If you don't follow them, you're in big trouble. And you don't want to get in trouble with these guys. So we get to our location. We set up our area of expertise or area of training. And I didn't realize that we jumped in right next to a highway. Um, and you could see the lights of Vegas behind this mountain. You could see, anybody that's ever been to Vegas or seen there's lights everywhere, you could see it from far, far, far off, just from the glow of the lights. And so on this road, I saw a convertible car with these young adults driving down this road, and they were partying, they were woo, and they are playing loud music, and they are having a good time. And I literally looked over there as a 21-year-old, and I went, man, I kind of wish I was in the car. Have you ever had a dying moment where you wish you were doing something else, but the Lord, for whatever reason, has you at this spot in your life, and, it, and now it's painful. But those are beautiful deaths. That's a time where it's good to die to self, because that grows stuff. You know, you heard your parents and elders of your family say you build character, but I mean, you know that once you move out of the house, God doesn't stop building you. And you're going to have those moments, and that night, something inside me died that it's okay. Y'all listen to this. This really hit home with me. It's okay to be the one he called to go to work. Amen. Amen. And when you do that, we're not going to have cotton candy Christianity. Sometimes you're going to share in the sufferings of Christ. You know, through all those times, and everybody up in here, I believe, can get up and give a testimony of where you've had some dying moments in your life, and it changed you in that moment. And I thank God that I pray that today he translates that in the spirit. And what is he trying to tell you in the spirit? Everything you've been through is for a reason and a purpose. And it's going to touch somebody's life. I, I can't help but think of the time. Every time Jesus leaves us patterns in his word. And we, if we just ask the Holy Spirit to reveal it to us, he'll show it to us. But every time Jesus, the man of God, has, that has literally bread in his hands, what does he do? Every time he has bread, he blesses it. He breaks it. And he gives it. And he says he's the bread from heaven. If we're Christians, that means we're like Christ. That means we're like bread. And there's going to be a time where he grabs you and he blesses you with salvation. And then he will allow you to be broken. But he don't break you to prove to you he's God and you're not. He, he allows you to be broken so then he can turn around and feed you to other people who don't know him. And as, you fee as he feeds you to other people, it will bless them. Your brokenness was not... Done in vain, your brokenness is for a good purpose. It will feed people. 
And it will continue to feed people. If y'all want to turn to John chapter 12, that's my first scripture. I pray this message today blesses you. Um, I'm thankful for Brother Daniel. He prayed this morning um, for me and and y'all and the service for today. And he reminded me in his prayer. Thank you, Becca. One other person want to get up here and pray while while we're having church. That'd be good. Y'all want to know what that's for? That's intercession. Uh, We take prayer seriously here. You get attacked a few times and you will take it very seriously. You won't take it lightly anymore. Um, He prayed uh, this morning for all of us for church service. And um, he mentioned in his prayer that it's okay to have godly sorrow. You know, see, there's two sorrows in this world. There's earthly sorrow and then there's godly sorrow. Earthly sorrow... The Lord doesn't want you to have this torment. He's the comforter. Why would he send the comforter if he wants you to have sorrow like that? He doesn't. But he does want you to have godly sorrow. Godly sorrow leads to repentance. It leads to a life of righteousness. It leads to a life loving Jesus and serving Jesus. Amen? You'll turn to John chapter 12. We'll start at verse 20. The fruitful grain of wheat. And I, I'm thankful that the Lord gave me this scripture at this time to give you a word, a, a timely word, and it's harvest. It's wheat harvest time right now. So I pray even after you leave church today or maybe next week as you see these combines in these fields and these truck drivers driving wheat, I pray that you're reminded of this scripture because Jesus used that. The one who invented wheat is using wheat to teach us something, a spiritual reality, a kingdom dynamic. A biblical principle. John chapter 12 verse 20. It says, Now there were certain Greeks among those who came up to worship at the feast. Then they came to Philip who was from Bethsaida of Galilee and asked him saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip came and told Andrew. And in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. You know, sometimes people want to seek out Jesus, but they don't know how. And they go to somebody who know who they know knows Jesus. You know, listen to this. We can learn from every every little scripture. And they will come to you because they know that you know Jesus and you'll go to Jesus for them for a time until they know how to do that. Until they get saved and then they learn that they can go to Jesus. Maybe you know Jesus, but maybe you don't know how to go to him with cancer. Maybe you don't know how to go to him with a broken marriage. Maybe you don't know how to go to him with an addiction that you're so disgusted with that you wish would go away. Maybe you're fearful of something and you don't know how to go to Jesus about that, but you know this person does, so then you go to them so they can show you through their actions and their prayers. How do you go to Jesus with that? I thank God for men and women in my family who know how to go to Jesus with a lot of things. Amen? It's no different today. Jesus never changes. He never will. Philip came and told Andrew, and in turn, Andrew and Philip told Jesus. But Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. He's obviously talking about he's about to be flogged, beat, spit on, beard ripped out, carries his own cross to Calvary, and then he's crucified a horrible death. Six hours on the cross, three hours of daylight, three hours of darkness. There's a message altogether in that. And then he gives up his spirit, Eli, Eli, Lima, Sabachthani, it means, my Lord, my Lord, why have you forsaken me? He's not having a weak moment or a lack of faith. He's quoting Psalm 22, verse 1. He's still saying to the Pharisees and Sadducees who are mocking him, if he knows knows God, then let him get himself down from there. Let, Let Elijah come and save him. And they're sitting there mocking him. And in his last words on the cross, he's literally telling those who should have known the scriptures... At Psalm 22, verse 1, he's literally saying, I am the Messiah. I am your king, and you're killing me. You should have bowed to me, not died, or not try to murder me. Amen? But the scriptures must be fulfilled. We knew that the Lamb of God was slain before the foundations of the earth, and it was beautiful. It was a beautiful death. But he said, the hour has come. How many know that every one of us will have an hour? Every one of us will have an hour. Nobody's immune to it. The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Everybody say dies. Now let's listen to this. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies. Maybe that's what he means about 
If you try to save your life, you'll lose it. You try to lose your life for his sake, you'll save it. The very first thing that the scriptures is telling me in the spirit as I, as I read this, and the Holy Spirit will speak to you as you read the scriptures, he will, he will, he will, is that there's some things that are not going to manifest. There's some things that I'm not going to see unless there's something in my life that has to die. There's certain, certain things in your life that needs to die. And there's no easy or gentle way to say that. There's some things in your life. There's some things in my life. I know that 3.7 miles, you go westbound on Bethel Canyon, you take a right, you go .2 miles down my driveway, you're going to see a barn on the left with a ranger tab on it, and right next to that barn is a burn barrel. And about four years ago, part of me died there as a husband. Do you know why? Because I got tired of making my wife cry. Because when I'd lose my temper and turn into an idiot, even as the pastor of this church, knowing what the scripture says about a hot-tempered man, I literally prayed and I said, Lord Jesus, and I think we need to get real with him. If we get real, we'll see how real of a king he is. We'll see how real of a savior he is, how beautiful he is, how gentle and how he does wash us in mercy like the band sang this morning. I said, Lord Jesus, I'm sick and tired of making my wife cry. Change something in me, kill something in me, or kill me dead and take me home with you that my wife may have a, a husband that would treat her right. I prayed that prayer. And something in that night at the burn barrel died in me as a husband. <laughs> and thank God it needed to die. Because the, only, the number one reason why a temper is there is because it's selfishness. The spirit of control. If I don't have my way, doesn't go that way, then I used to throw a little 30-something-year-old fit. And that just needs to stop. Amen? And before you chunk rocks at me and think that, yeah, you better, you should know better, preacher, what in your life? What in your life needs to die? Maybe it's not temper. Maybe you run off. Some men run towards it and attack it, and some men run off and avoid it. Same with the ladies. Amen? Scriptures are pretty clear. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. And I'm thankful that my Lord is teaching me how to honor my bride more and more and more. He who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, everybody say anyone. anyone. Doesn't just mean the preachers or the teachers or the evangelists, the elders, the lay pastors, the deacons, the team leaders, the team reps, the missionaries. If anyone, if anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him, my Father, will honor. I believe in Jesus' name that there are certain prayers that God wants to answer in your life. You've called out to God. And you've asked Him to do A, B, or C. And some of those answers will be manifested once you die to yourself in a certain area. You know, one of the biggest hang-ups I had... It, with Christianity and church and Bible and all this stuff, I literally used to think if you went to church twice a week, there's something wrong with you. You're a little fanatic. I used to think that. But I, I'm so thankful for quiet times. I, want to, I will always encourage quiet times with the Word. Quiet times with the Word. Quiet times with the Word. Because your Lord, your King will speak to you. Amen? Amen? And I remember it was just this beautiful revelation. I was like, wow, it's something so simple. When Jesus said this right here, he, in one of my quiet times, he said this right here. Jason, you do realize I can change the things you love. The reason you don't want to come to me is because you think that you have to turn away from the things you love. Know this, that I'm so powerful that as you turn from the things you love, I will change what you love. Amen. I will cause you to love me more than any club. I will cause you to love me more than any uh, good feeling you can get in the flesh. I will cause you to love the things that I love. And here's the beautiful thing. The things that I love are eternal things. And the things, you, if I change your, what you love, you'll be able to keep the things you love forever. Isn't that beautiful? Amen. 
Amen. <laughs> Preacher. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Praise God. Thank you, Jesus, for little boys. Uh, y'all turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4, please. Oop, that's not it. Timothy is a letter to Timothy from Paul. Timothy is a young pastor, preacher. But don't mistake in this set of scriptures as, oh, that's for the preachers. Because let's be honest, we're all preachers. It's just what you're preaching and who's listening to you. That's right. Amen. Amen. Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, 1 through 5. says, I uh, uh, charge you therefore. I mean, you know that in apostle translation, he, he, this is not a suggestion. Amen. This is the apostle Paul saying, you will do this. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word! Exclamation point. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. For the time will come when they will, endure, they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. What do you do when you have an itch? More so, raise your hand in here if you ever had an itch and you can't get to it. Full panic mode, right? You see them horses on the side of the fence like this? <laughs> You're like, I don't know what's going on, but he's loving it. You have an itch. That means you can be hearing a message and it doesn't scratch the area you want scratched. So you'll turn that message off and you'll go listen to a message that will itch or scratch that itch you want. That's what that means. Basically, you're only heaping up teachers that make you feel good. You're only heaping up teachers that preach only what you want to hear. Right? And we can do that, especially these days. You can YouTube it to death. You can have you a whole list of preachers that you enjoy. Now, I'm not saying that's wrong. I'm saying, but this is where we go wrong. Is when you start to hear a message that you know is truth, and you turn it off mentally, and you don't listen to it. Well, I like this preacher because he says this is okay, or she says this is okay, or I, I listen to this preacher because they say this. How many know that that's... The Apostle Paul said that one's Apollos and one is Paul. What you're doing is not good. This should be your preacher. This should be your pastor, your shepherd, King Jesus. I'm trying to figure out how to say this. If you've been coming here a while and you start saying, Brother Jason said, more than it is written, I don't know what that means. <laughs> Maybe that means, listen. I don't even know what that was. Bulb? That's a whole nother message. False light will not always last. <laughs> but the real light. Thank you, Lord. Maybe I need to stand over here. <laughs> Maybe y'all were feeling a little intense and the Lord wanted y'all to laugh a little bit. But if you get to where you're saying, Brother Jason said, you're wrong. You're putting me up on a pedestal. I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to hurt your feelings. I'm going to make you mad. You just give me time. And I won't mean to. That's not my heart. I won't mean to. But this right here. The Bible says in the book of Acts that every single time they heard a word preached. Now, y'all listen to this. Translation of this. Every time they heard the word of God preached, they then took that, went back, and made sure in the scriptures what they were just told was the truth. Amen? Now, let me ask you this. In the book of Acts. Did they have the Bible? So what scriptures were they looking at? 
the Old Testament. So not only do we need to look in the scriptures, but sometimes we need to look in a specific area of the scriptures. My point is this, is that um, we should not put any preacher up on a pedestal. Um, here's one I've heard, and I felt like it needed to be addressed for some times, and I get it. I get it. I understand it. I understand it. But sometimes if people hear that I'm not preaching today, they'll get mad. Some of them will leave, and some of them will be bitter and resentful as they're sitting there listening to somebody else preach. Lord gave me a word for this church about six years ago when I was reading the Bible. And in the Old Testament, in the boring part that you think is the boring part, you can really learn some stuff. When it starts going through the 12 tribes of Israel, it goes to this certain tribe and it says, Out of whom's household came 17 captains. That means certain bloodlines will produce leadership, commanders. And I stopped at that point in my desk in my bedroom. I pushed the Bible and I said, Lord Jesus... Would you cause King's Trail to produce commanders, produce leaders, produce pastors and preachers and teachers? Would you do that? And to do that, you have to raise people up. People gave me a chance. In Jesus' name, I pray they give you a chance. Where's my brother? There he is. He's praying. That's a preacher out there. He's a preacher. I told him to go visit the men's team leader. And asked to do the next devotional that it, when it's open. We need time to do that. So you got to have You can't. If guys, no joke. If I'm the only one you're listening to, you're wrong, and you just matter time for you and get mad and go somewhere else. Don't do that. Jesus is your shepherd. Amen. amen. Um, that's why we bring speakers in from time to time. It's not. Be, if anybody knows me, it's not because I'm lazy, and it dang sure ain't because I don't want to preach. If you want a sermon, come eat a drink a glass of tea on my front porch. I will continue what I talked about today. I promise you I can't help it. I love, 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 love the Bible. Matter of fact, if anything, i got to calm down. It's when to shut up. <laughs> Amen. 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 Okay. Thank you, Lord. All right. Turn to Luke chapter 16. Yes. This is a very sobering scripture. And this is one of the times that I do... Um, one of my quiet places, you can drive through Van Alstine Cemetery sometime, and you'll see my truck parked on the east side where that big stone cross is. If y'all have never been there, it's a beautiful stone cross. And uh, I just go out there and sit on a little bench, and the breeze going, and read the word, and have some quiet time. Um, but I'm reminded of this set of scriptures. Luke chapter 16, starting verse 19, the rich man Lazarus. All red letter. So this is Jesus telling this story. Many people debate if it's a story or a parable, but it, I believe it's a story because it uses a real man's name. In all the parables, they don't use names. They use generalities and titles and positions. But verse 19 says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day, lived in luxury every day. And it, it's real easy to dismiss, dismiss the scriptures as, as I'm reading this saying, Well, I ain't rich. Do 10 minutes of research on Google with third world countries and then tell me, then tell me you're not rich. I remember reading a, a Voice of the Martyrs magazine. Every once in a while I'll get a Voice of the Martyrs magazine and I was reading it and it showed this little boy from India. Y'all listen to this, a little boy. I'm talking about four or five year old little boy laying next to a dog. And it, the quotations next to it, it said, this is my mama. Because he just took some of the milk from that dog's breast that was pregnant. That's hungry. A little boy who doesn't have a mom and a dad on the streets. We were very, very rich. We were very rich. So I don't want us to read the scriptures and go, well, that's not me. It's all relative. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed. Well, that'll make you not pass a homeless person. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And I, I verified this this morning, you people who know a lot about dogs. I, I always heard it, but I had to verify it this morning that a dog's saliva has bacteria in it that we don't have, and it can actually clean. 
So literally, Lazarus was on the streets just wanting some crumbs from this rich man. But check this out. God is so lovely that he even sent dogs to lick on his sores. Anybody that's ever had a sore wants some relief because they can get dry and crack and have lots of pain. How many of you know that God will use a dog, a donkey, a dove, a bird? He uses whatever he wants. Sometimes it's not in the form of a check. Sometimes it's the form of somebody on the side of the road. Sometimes it's a song on the radio as you're driving down the road. God will, say, God will do whatever he wants. Don't limit God. Don't put him in a box. You know the last time we put God in a box, he said, if you touch this box, I'll kill you. There's some encouragement. Don't put him in a box. Amen. Don't handcuff him because he can do anything. With God, there's nothing that is impossible. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Verse 22, so it was that the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. See, the man of God, the one who belongs to God, will experience death differently than the one who doesn't know God. And the man of God or the woman of God that dies will be carried by the angels. Other parables will verify that. Scripture supports Scripture. How beautiful is that? Not only, you know the only thing that's escorted in the land is dignitaries. One year in McKinney, uh, we were told to block certain roads um, because the president was coming through. And let me tell you what, he was escorted for sure. God's person, when they pass, will be escorted. I love that. That the beggar died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off. And Lazarus in his bosom. I don't understand this fully, obviously, because I haven't died. But they could see each other. You imagine not only being in Hades or hell, but imagining not only being there, but being able to see where you could have been. And how does he know Abraham's name? Because when you die, your eyes are open. That'll preach all by itself. When you die to self in Christ Jesus, you'll, scales will fall off your eyes. You'll see differently. You'll see differently. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger. You know, the Bible declares on the Sermon on the Mount, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. This rich man, while he's living, showed no mercy. Lazarus was at the gates. That means near him. You got anybody near you that needs some help? Maybe you look at them differently today. Send Lazarus, and he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son... Wow. Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus' evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Everybody look up here at this casket, please. Once you're in here, if the Lord tarries, wherever you go, the Bible just told every one of us that you will have the ability to remember where you just came from. You will have the ability to remember how you lived your life. He said, remember, you will have the ability to remember. And I think one of the craziest things is that you'll have the ability to remember how many times you refused the Lord. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you should send. Oh, verse 26, I skipped it. It says, and besides all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf, so that those who want to pass, listen to this, from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. You might want to, but you ain't getting to. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Now he turns into an evangelist. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Y'all want a scary prayer that will produce much fruit in your life? You don't have to answer yes, but I'll just throw it out there and then you can deliberate in your own mind between you and the Holy Spirit. 
Lord, your scripture just said, then I beg you, therefore, Father Abraham, would you send him to my father's house? For I have five brothers. You tell them, at least they come to this place of torment. I believe that if we had a better idea of what hell's like, it would open our mouth more. I believe if we had a better idea of what Jesus is like, it would open our mouth more. I'm, I'm surprised and thankful. Y'all have heard me talk about it many times up here, how the Lord tell me to pray for somebody, or pray with somebody, or do whatever. And I'll chicken out. And I ask the Lord to give me courage to help me not be a little. I say this prayer. I mean, you know, he wants real prayers. You try to pretty up prayer all you want, but if it ain't from the heart, it ain't nothing. I said, Lord, would you stop letting me be a big old cupcake? Well, I got to be a, a little baby. Why am I a little pussy cat? Help me be bold. He'll give you, he'll answer those prayers. But I, I'm amazed at what I thought people would respond like if you speak to them about Jesus, you pray to them about Jesus, or love on them like Jesus, how receptive they are. I, I told a story this morning. Anybody got an afternoon snack they, they like? Nobody in the whole church. Every once in a while, I'm driving down the road, and if I see a quick check or an all subs, I want me a burrito and a Red Bull. <laughs> Don't hate on me. It's sugar-free. <laughs> and especially if I'm going through Princeton at all subs, they got some really good chimichangas. I mean, I'm like getting, I, I told my wife, I just said, I know I'm getting excited or getting old because I get excited about food. I want to get the chimichanga. So I go in there, and how many of you know the Lord will surprise you? Yes. My mind is on chimichanga, Red Bull, back in truck, air conditioned, praise and worship, woo down the road. Yep. I walk up to the counter, and the Lord says, pray for her. I'm like, no. <laughs> I just want my chimichanga. <laughs> I don't want to be strong Christian right now. And I was like, Lord, why do I fight you? You want to know your ability to negotiate? Have the Lord ask you to do something. So I said, Lord, why am I so scared? Just help me. Give me courage. He said, why don't you ask her? God will speak to you this way. He will. He said, just ask her. I said, can I ask you something? I'm starting to get people in line. Why can't we do this when we're all by ourselves? We don't have to have a line. <laughs> Lord, <laughs> man. I said, can I ask you a question? She was like, well, you sure can, honey. I'm like, she's not shy. <laughs> and I, I go, I'm not trying to be weird, but the Lord just told me to pray for you. She said, oh, thank you so much. My, I've had this terrible morning. I forgot how she said it. And she literally put her hands on the counter and went, go ahead. <laughs> and I thought I was going to ask. And she'd be like, no, weirdo, get out of here, bearded man. But I'm surprised at people's response when you do love on them. How many people want prayer? Amen? They want prayer. They want prayer. And now this rich man is wanting Lazarus, or wanting Abraham to send Lazarus to his five brothers. Verse 28, For I have five brothers. They may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. I never realized this, but people in hell actually wish that the Christian would go witness to their still existing and living and breathing family members. That's a thought. Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets, let him hear them. And he said, no, Father Abraham. I... But if one goes to them from the dead, keep in mind, this is Jesus telling this story. But if them come from the dead, they will repent. Now he sees the importance of repentance. But he said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Here is a quiet prayer that if you want to be saved or you want to be set on fire by the Lord. You know, there's times in our lives that we, we know if we said a certain prayer, God would set us on fire. But let's be honest, there's times in our lives we don't want him to because what we got going, we're really enjoying 
Amen. That's the truth. We know that's the truth. But no joke, reading God's Word will give you new prayers. How many know that God is not offended if you ask Him to persuade you? He went up to Matthew and said, follow me. Matthew's like, I'm gone. <laughs> right? Doubting Thomas walked with the man. He said, I will not believe until I see the scars in his hand and the piercing on his side. Amen? What did Jesus do? Thomas, come here. Put your fingers here, your hand here. Do not be unbelieving, but believe. God is not offended if you ask him, persuade me. There's just scarier prayer than the earlier one. How short and powerful would that prayer be? Lord, persuade me. Even the Apostle Paul said at one time in his letters, For I am persuaded. Now neither death nor life, things seen or unseen, principalities or powers can separate us from the love of Christ. He, Paul said, I was persuaded. That means at some point in time, he was not persuaded. It is okay for a Christian to be over here in unbelief as long as they don't stay there. And you don't have to stay there if you ask Jesus to persuade you. Amen? Ask Jesus to persuade you. Raise your hand in here if you have any friends or family members that are atheists or agnostics. I was witnessing to one. Y'all, Oh my goodness. How many know that God can do anything? It's, it's getting to where it's almost like a sport now. I'm just curious to see what God's going to do with it. But I say I was talking to an atheist and I said, you know what, we're, this conversation, we're just getting mad at each other. You're mad at me because I believe in fairy tales. I'm mad at you because you're stiff-necked and hard-hearted. You know, we're, we're, let's stop. I said, let, let me just ask you to do this one thing. What? And I don't want to go through the whole conversation because it would take another 10 minutes. But in the end, he raised his hand in mockery to make fun. You say, I said, you say this prayer with me. Say Lord Jesus, he goes, I don't believe in him. I said, then it doesn't matter. You're just saying words. He said, okay. I said, say Lord Jesus. He said, Lord Jesus, convince me, convince me that you're real, that you're real. I said, amen. I said, put your hand down. He goes, that's it? I'm like, yeah, that's it for now. <laughs> that's it for now. week later, getting baptized. You know, he wouldn't let me and Hewlin baptize him unless he was on his knees in the pond. And he looked up at me and said this, I don't know why, but I keep feeling led to just get on my knees. Every time you start talking about Jesus, I, I just, in my mind, I immediately hit my knees. I said, you know, that's scripture happening that at the name of Jesus, Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. I said, you're living out Scripture and don't even realize it. You know why? Because the Scripture is now living within you. Isn't that beautiful? So don't be afraid of them. Talk to them. Love on them like Jesus. And if you want to see God do something magnificent, lead them in that short prayer. Amen. All right, my last set of Scriptures before we do something. Y'all be prepared for the ending. Can I give you a hint? You can't really fully prepare in the flesh. No. Just ask the Lord help me. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Revelation. I'm sorry. As I'm turning to, I guess I could tell y'all. Revelation chapter 14. Lord help me. Starting at verse 6. The book of Revelation is a very strong book. It is, uh, it, it, uh, when I read the book of Revelation, it, um, it, it touches on some things in my life, in my heart, that nothing else can touch. It's very strange, but you know it's a God thing when it's happening. I used to get frustrated because I didn't understand the book of Revelation, and the Lord, this is what I'm talking about, we be obedient to Him, die to self. I had to die to my own personal time. And he said, go in your room. At the time, I had a rocking chair in the room. And uh, he said, read it. 
All 22 chapters. And I read it. And you know what he said when I was done? He said, read it again. And it wasn't until the second time I read it that things started popping up. That I could understand it more. Jesus in the Bible declares that he is the one that opens your eyes to the scriptures. So if the Jesus that did it then, he has to do it now. But it comes through obedience. Revelation chapter 14 verse 6. The proclamations of the three angels. Wow. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice. Everybody say a loud voice. Fear God. What is the first thing out of that angel's mouth? It's not coincidence. Lord Jesus, increase my fear of you. This is not a tormenting fear. This is a reverence. You want a little minor, 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 minor scale level of what he's talking about? Imagine in the presence of a 450 pound male lion. Because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. How you would feel. Would you not be careful? Even if the trainer goes, no, he's a kitty cat. He ain't going to hurt you. You'd be like, it's a 450 pound cat. Amen. Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And worship Him, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. And another angel, this is a second out of the three angels, and another angel followed, saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Uh, Babylon, there's a debate on what that means, but it's a world system. Know that this world system is going to fall. It's going to fall. And the word fornication is, if you see that word in the Greek, it is how you say it is porneia. That's where you get the word porn. Let me read it again. And another angel followed, saying, Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. Then the third angel. Everybody say, the third angel. Followed them, saying with a loud voice, there's that loud voice again, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength. Wow. What does that look like? Into the cup of his indignation. He shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night. Who worship the beast in his image. Whoever receives the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. And the faith of Jesus. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me. Right. Blessed. Everybody say blessed. Blessed are the dead. Who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Nobody knows the day nor the hour, and nobody knows their hour of departure or death. So if you died today, would you be with the Lord? Absent from the body means to be present with the Lord, to live as Christ, to die as gain, is what is promised to the Christian soldier. Well done, good and faithful ser servant, or depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That is your choice. At Calvary, he gave us a choice. Jesus in the middle, the center of all things. Psalm 118.8, you'd see that in the center of God's Word. This is not coincidence that God does all this on purpose. And at the center of Calvary is Jesus. On the right, there's two thieves. And if you read the Gospels, you would understand that at the beginning, both thieves mocked him. And then somewhere at that time, that six hours on the cross, one repented and said, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? He said, truly I sell you this day. You will be with me in paradise. Paradise also means garden. Started with a tree, ended with a tree. How does this all happen? Paradise, garden, another word for it is heaven. Isn't that beautiful? So today we have a choice. 
There will not be any praise and worship. There will not be any prayers down here at least. Unless the Lord convicts you and causes you to pray. But today if you would. You don't have to. You're all grown. Make your own decisions. But today we're going to do a pass by. And you're going to attend your own funeral. This is not sadistic. This is not weird. You're going to have a one second message at this coffin. One second message. In one second, you come up to this coffin, you go just like this, you will get the message, and you walk off. Amen? If you don't want to, when we stand up in the back, this section first, Joe, you want to stand up and lead them? Y'all stand up in the back. Y'all come down on this side, you're passed by, one second message. You keep going out that side. If you don't want to come down here, when you stand up, you come out, you just leave, wherever you're going to go anyway. Amen? Cheryl, can y'all, and I'll, y'all play music that would be like at a funeral. No joke. And then uh, let the Lord speak to you. I pray the Holy Spirit speaks to every, everyone here. Amen. Amen. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me I can only imagine yeah surrounded by your glory what will my heart feel will I dance for you Jesus or in all of you be still will I stand in your presence to my knees will i fall will i sing hallelujah will i be able to speak it all i can only imagine i can only imagine i can only imagine when that day comes when I find myself standing in the sun I can only imagine when all I will do is forever forever worship you I can only imagine I can only imagine Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus? Or in all of you be still? Will I stand in your presence? Or to my knees will I fall? Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak it all? I can only imagine. Yeah, I can only imagine. Hello everybody again, uh, you just finished listening to the sermon today and uh, I have another scripture, imagine that, now, lots of God's word being poured into you today or tonight or however what time um, this message is reaching you, but in Mark chapter 4 verse 15 it talks about the parable of the sower and the seed God's seed is God's word and listen to this real quick it says and these are the ones by the wayside where the word is sown when they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in your hearts so since God's word has been sown in your heart during that message it is our prayer that God solidifies that seed and protects it and watches over it and may it be watered and just as God's word says, may he give the increase. And I pray he gives the increase of salvation in your life. And I need you to hear this real quick. I need you to pause what you're doing. I need you to listen. And I pray these words sink deep down into your soul. The Bible says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So if you do, you do believe that to be true, then I pray that you, that you say this prayer. And you know what? You don't want to say it if you don't mean it, but, don't, but if you do believe it and you do mean it, then you need to confess it, you know? 
when, gospel, when the gospel of Jesus Christ is preached, it fills up your heart and uh, you desire to be saved. So you just say a simple prayer like this. You say, Lord Jesus, I ask that you forgive me of all my sins. I ask that you come into my life and be the boss of my life. Today I confess you as Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Be Lord of my life. And if you did that, your salvation is um, totally and completely secured. And I would encourage you to go tell somebody that you got saved today or tonight or whenever you heard this message. And I pray we see you again back at the sermon section. I pray you come and visit us in person if, uh, um, if you're around this local area. But either way, may God bless you and we love you all in Jesus' name. Bye-bye.